son tells his father, hey, you know, I don't want to have to wait for you to die. Give me my inheritance now. And his father agrees, gives him his inheritance, and then he goes off to another land, and he just wastes it. He parties, he does, you know, I think the King James says riotous living or something like that. So, <laughs> so he wastes all that money, and in the end he ends up poor and destitute, and he thinks to himself, you know what, my dad's hired men live better than this. They at least have some food. And so I need to just go back home, maybe I'll just tell my dad, I know I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, and I've already used up my inheritance. Um, just let me be a hired man. You know, so he comes back, kind of expecting that he's, you know, maybe going to have to really grovel to get back in his father's good graces to just hire him. Um, but his father has a totally different outlook on this. His father's been waiting and watching for him. And his father sees him coming from a long way off, you know, and recognizes, that's my son. And so he goes running out to meet his son. And he clothes him with a robe, with a ring, sandals on his feet. He gives him the kind of the signs of sonship, you know, and says, hey, I'm so glad to have you back. And he throws a big party for him. You know, and Jesus introduced this parable plus um, some other parables with the following verse. It's out of Luke 15, 7. And I want us to be praying this today over our neighborhood. So it says, In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. You know, so God throws a big party anytime somebody comes into the family. And so I want us to be praying that for our neighborhood, that there's going to be some big parties happening in heaven um, because they're coming to know him. So pray with me, please. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that this is something that's so on your heart. Lord, I pray that you'd help it to be on our hearts as well, that we would really just have such a rejoicing and such a desire to see people come to know you. Uh, you know, that it would just be something that we think about and pray about all the time. Help us to really be praying uh, for the people that we know who need to know you, Lord. Because it is true, you are coming back, and they need to know you. And Lord, I pray that you would just cause the people in this neighborhood, open their eyes, that you would reveal to them the truth, that you'd make it so that they are not blinded, but they're able to see spiritual truth. And I pray, Lord, that you would just reveal to them that you love them, that you sent your Son to come after them, that you want to seek them, and to seek and to save them, Lord. And I pray, God, that you just help us as House of Purpose, help us to be here for, you know, when they come in. I pray, Lord, that you'd also just bless the times that we are outside the walls. Uh, Friday, Lord, we're doing Community Connection. I pray, Lord, that you would help people from this neighborhood to come over, open up doors of conversation with them. Help us to be able to talk to people about you, Lord. And I pray also, Lord, that we, too, would just even connect with them, you know, that they would continue to come. And so we just thank you, Lord, for helping us with that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we would love to pray over you as well. And so if you have any prayer requests, uh, just fill out one of those prayer request forms that's at your seat. And you can turn that into the offering when it comes by. You know, maybe you've got somebody that you know of who's one of those lost people that you would like us to pray with you about, um, that they would come into the family. Uh, that would be a great thing to put down. Or you can put down any request. And so now is a great time to be preparing those because we're going to receive the offering in just a few minutes. And also, if you are wanting to honor your Father God today on Father's Day, this would be a great time as well uh, to prepare your offering. And so while you're doing that, I wanted to talk to you about the importance of fathers. And I've got a video to show you. It's um, by this group called Tell. Well, it's called Tell Them Now. But it's the same group that did the Mother's Day one that we showed on Mother's Day. Um, but I just thought this was really a pretty touching video. So. Oh man. 
Dad, what about me makes you cry? Dad, what about me makes you proud? <laughs> Dad, what about me makes you proud? Can I attach to that one? Yeah. Yes. Just about everything that you do. You're loving. You're funny. I could go on and on. What makes me proud about you is you just being yourself. I had trouble with alcohol, it was actually an intervention. Even with all the other people there, you were the, the real reason that I made the decision to go into the treatment center that I did. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. You're helpful. Yeah, you forgot the fun part. <laughs> Your attention to uh, hygiene. You made it easy. That's it. I miss having a chance to just check in with you. I miss your sketchbooks. I love you. I love you too. You got it. We don't say it enough. Ooh. Hey. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> it doesn't compute until they're gone. <laughs> so tell them now. What a weird saying, so let's be kids. I like that one. I just thought that was really good. And one thing that I really thought was interesting was notice how nervous they were about this. You know, I just think um, that's kind of an in interesting thing. I don't know if you would be that nervous maybe like with your mom, but I was thinking about the fact that I think sometimes what a father says is kind of more weighty. You know, I, and I don't mean to negate, you know, like what moms say, but I just feel like, with, at least like with my mom, she very often, you know, would say encouraging things to me and encourage me. Um, but it was a lot more rare for my father to say something to me. You know, and some of that's just about the amount of time you know, spent with you. My, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so of course she spent a lot more time with us. My dad worked hard, did a lot of overtime supporting us, you know, so he didn't have as much time to say anything. But I found that what he would say really would impact me. That just meant so much to me to hear something encouraging from my father. And so I just want you guys to know that you are super important in the life of a kid. You know, they really need to hear your encouragement. And this reminded me a little bit of what uh, we read a few months ago when we were doing First Thessalonians. You know, and there was a verse where Paul compared what a father does to what he and Paul, or he and Silas and Timothy were doing with the Thessalonians. And so let's look at First Thessalonians 2, 11 to 12. It says, And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. And there's just one word in there. Actually, there's a lot of words in there that I think are great, like that pleaded, encouraged, urged. Um, but I just want to look at just pleaded today. And that is the word parakaleo in the Greek. And it means to call to one side, admonish, exhort, to beg, encourage, strengthen by consolation, instruct, teach. So there's a whole lot there, isn't there, just in that one word, when it says that they pleaded with them as a father would. But I like that to call to one side, because this is not like a distant father, you know, who's sort of like, oh, you know, you, you go do that. I'll be back here. 
No, this is a father like calling their child to their side to help them. You know, like, I'm going to show you how to do something. I'm right here. I'll do it. I'll let you do it and show you where you're doing it wrong. You know, so I just was reminded so much of my own father. Um, you know, he always like tried to train my brother and I. I remember him even one day showing both of us how a car engine worked. Now, my brother ate that up. I have to admit, I was a little bit like, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I know how to put gas in it. That's about all I need to know, isn't it? You know? He's like, no, you need to know how it works. I was like, okay. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate that he took the time, you know, that he wanted to do that. And he was always, uh, you know, he helped me a lot with my homework as well. Um, my mom was definitely an English person. She helped with the English homework, but he helped with the math and science homework, which I really appreciated and spent hours and hours sometimes. Sometimes I would leave him with a problem, I'd be like, Dad, how do you do this one? You know, and he'd look at it for a little bit and he'd go, let me think about it. You know, and so then eventually I'd be going to bed and he was still up trying to figure out how to do my, my homework. So, <laughs> so he was very dedicated. I appreciated that, you know. So I just think it's really amazing and the other thing that I wanted to point out about this word, this parakaleo, it's very similar to another Greek word. And that is the word that is used for the Holy Spirit in the book of John when he's called the helper. Uh, that is the word parakletos, which is very close to that one, right? So they are kind of related. I just think if you want to think about it that way, that as a father, you know, you are a helper. You're, the, you're a comforter. You're a counselor. You know, all the things that the Holy Spirit does, of course, you're not going to be quite as good as the Holy Spirit, but <laughs> and you're going to need the Holy Spirit's help to do that. But I just think it's really important, uh, the things that you're able to bring to your children's lives, and they definitely need you. And so I just want to encourage us today to honor the fathers around us, and if your father is still with you, uh, make sure he knows today how important he is. And so we're going to receive the offering and the prayer requests here. And so we have some electronic ways to give. Uh, but we're also going to receive it here in the service. And I'm going to pray over the offering and the prayer requests. So, well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We thank you that you're our Father. And we thank you that you created fathers. We are grateful for what they have been in our lives. Lord, I also just pray, if anybody, you know, maybe that wasn't their relationship with their father, their earthly father, I pray, Lord, that you would just show them how much you are the perfect father. And, Lord, that you can be there to, to be that counselor, that helper. You know, I just thank you, Lord, that, that you would use that in people's lives. And, Lord, I just want to pray for the, the men in prison. Danny was mentioning that this is a hard day for them. And so we pray, Lord, for their comfort. Pray, Lord, that you would just help them to cry out to you even in the middle of that. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them something that would help them this day because you are the comforter. And, Lord, I pray that you would, you know, just help, help them to even read something in your word that will speak to them and strengthen them. And, Lord, I pray also that you would uh, just use this offering to help other people find out how much you want to be their father, how much you want to come into that relationship with them. Pray, Lord, that you be with every prayer request too, Lord, that you are, you know, you know, as a good father, everything that's going on with them. You know even more than they do about what's going on with them. And so we just thank you, Lord, for having your perfect will in every situation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Lonnie and Derek are going to receive the prayer requests and the offerings. And so while they're doing that, we've got just a few announcements. We've got our Tuesday night dinner and Bible study. So we're doing the awe of God. This has been a great study on this. And so that starts at 5 p.m. We do dinner first and then the study. And then we've got our Wednesday Zoom prayer line. And that's from 6.30 to 7. If you'd like me to send you the text, um, let me know. And I can send out that link. Um, so it makes it easy for you to join. And then we've also got on Friday our community connection, which will be just right out front here, 5 to 7. Come at 4 if you want to volunteer. Um, we're going to be having a taco bar. That'll be good. And we'll have some games. Um, 
Maybe this time I'll do more axe throwing. That would be good, I think. Yeah, axe throwing. Axe throwing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're supposed to grunt while you do it. That's right. So, <laughs> so that'll be fun. And we'll just uh, meet with our neighbors out here. And so please be praying for that, for people to come over and for opportunities to, to talk to them and get to know them. And with that, I'll call Pastor David. Yeah, my dad turned uh, 88 this month, and he goes bowling three days a week still. And so he bowls like in the 190s, high 180s, and he said, you know, uh, I, I bowl a 167. He goes, I really needed to be encouraged. I'm like, man, I would find that fantastic. <laughs> so... And baseball, he said, when I come to town, he goes, I'm going to go see your Rockies. He likes the Tampa uh, Rays. And so, Nancy, you have to go to a baseball game. But he's been out here several times. But when we were kids, we'd always hit baseball, see who could hit the baseball the farthest. And my dad was great. We called him Superman. He could really hit that thing into the woods. And so, but... Uh, yeah, he loves baseball, he loves bowling, and he's still at it at 88. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, I want to talk about getting ready for the Lord. For the next few weeks, I want to talk about the rapture. Now, the ra word rapture is not found in the Bible, but it is an event that occurs um, where there's going to be a great disappearance of the church, where all of a sudden the church, what restrains evil through the Holy Spirit living in us is gone. And then evil is abounding. And we already see our world changing. And uh, I was sharing in, in Five Points this weekend that, you know, now's not the time to harden your heart with the parable of the seed and the sower. And, you know, you want that word to be engrafted in you in particular in this time, the word of truth. And so between the resurrected rapture, billions of people are going to exit this planet. Billions of people. Um, but billions will be left behind. And this rapture, this great disappearance of God's church, we, Jesus gave us a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, precursors to when this event would happen. It'll be, however, we'll be here and it'll be just an ordinary day. We don't know what day it will be, but it'll happen in a twinkling of an eye. So that's, if you just blink your eyes right now, it's, it's, it's quicker than a blink, okay? It's your eyes just kind of, a sparkle in your eyes, you know, when you think of your, uh, <laughs> Before you knew your dad, you were a sparkle in his eye. Never mind. Uh, but, <laughs> though, no one will know. But God, the Father, knows the time. The Son doesn't even know. And we're blessed that we have the prophecies in Scripture that tell us of these events. We're thankful, as Jesus is saying in uh, Matthew 24, if you'd like to read that whole chapter, it'll give you an understanding of some end time events. But of that day, no one knows the hour, not even the angels in heaven, but the Father. The Father's going to say to the Son, go get your church. Go get your bride. But as the days of Noah were on earth, the people that are oblivious to this fact, they're going to continue on with what they're doing. And he says, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's, that's what it'll be. They'll be doing everything that they were doing before. And, and some very corrupt and some evil things. But some things are so subtle that, you know, I was sharing that, you know, uh, then we can put on a persona when I was in five points. And we can have... You know, people can perceive us in a certain way, and then we can project an image, and then, oh, but God knows exactly who we are and where we're at, and He knows exactly where we're at with Him. 
For as the days before the flood, they were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying and given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And I thought about so many people passing by as I was giving a message in five points about the Word of God and the power of the Word of God. And I'll bring that message sometime, you know, right after we come back from our anniversary trip. Me and Nancy go on an anniversary trip every year. But they didn't know. I've seen people just passing by the other day, and I thought, well, they didn't know. And then, uh, you know, like in Noah's time, they didn't know. And, and then the flood came and swept them away. They're about all living in whatever way they were living. And they, actually, it was a very evil time then, too. And it says, so will it will be with when the Son of Man comes. So it's going to be an ordinary day, folks. It's just going to be an ordinary day. And suddenly many who live now with Jesus as Lord, they will vanish from the earth. Many, though, will miss this rapture because they only live for the satisfaction of an earthly and temporary existence. They're not living for the future. They're not living for eternity. They're living for a temporary comfort. They're living for the next time they can go to Starbucks. They're living for the next time they can do this. The next time they can go see the major, next major concert event or, or whatever. And the Father in Heaven will tell the Son, now it's time to go get your bride. And there's a semblance of what it is for a Jewish wedding, where the Father tells the Son, go and get your bride. And so the son would come and get the bride, but the bride had to be ready to go. So we look at this rapture of the church, and the word of God tells us in that verse 36, but only the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but only my father. So the father says, okay, it's time, son, go get the church. Where will you be on that day? There are people that attend church, but it doesn't mean that they're ready to go. The parable of the ten virgins is an example of that fact. In the parable of the ten virgins, as recorded in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13, is a story told by Jesus. And notice this comes right after he's telling about the end times. Uh, that's illustrated, and it's about the importance about being ready. And the bridegroom in this parable is Jesus Christ. And the church is portrayed as the bride of Christ. In the first century, we mentioned the Jewish wedding. The bridegroom and his close friends would leave home and go to the bride's home, where various ceremonies would take place. Then, at nightfall, a procession through the streets would take place in which everyone in the procession was expected to carry his or her own torch. The ten virgins in the parable represent the, dry, the bridesmaids who had been assisting the bride. They're expecting to meet the bridegroom as he came into the bride's house. So this is the symbolism of this. This is a symbolism of this culture that, that this... Uh, uh, parable of the ten virgins is about. So to be ready for Jesus' return, we have to be born again. We have to have a saving faith in Jesus Christ. We have to have a lamp that is led. It involves a belief in his death, burial, and his resurrection. It is a convincing faith, a changed life, where there is you're lit on fire and ready for the Lord to return. The five virgins with the extra oil represent those who were truly born again. They're waiting eagerly for Jesus to come. His return. We just sung about that. We sang, come, Jesus, come. And with our hearts we sing, come, Jesus, come. There's a, an igniting of a faith in the fact that these things um, represent what is the things that are which are to come, eschatology and scripture. And so we have a saving faith that we're determined to see his return. We're not living for everything else in this world. No, we're living for him. And as we 
say no matter how long it takes. In another part of scripture it says they've been proclaiming this for centuries. Things continue on as they were before. That's what people are saying now. What's the point in going to church? What's the point in living for God? I think I'll just live for myself. And so they become their own God and they indulge themselves. But we're to be ready for the rapture. We're to have oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit, ignited with God's word. Amen. The ignition factor is the word of God. And the Holy Spirit activated in our lives. Remember, they had to wait into Jerusalem until they had received power from on high. They heard the word. They walked with the word. Jesus was the word of God. But they needed that, 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 that fuel, that oil in a lamp. And the word to come on fire. They, they didn't understand everything that was said until after the, they had received the Holy Spirit. And the five virgins with the extra oil, those that are truly born again, they have a saving faith. They're determined to be ready for his return. No matter how long it takes, they're ready. No matter what adverse circumstance they have to face, they want to be ready. And so that scripture, in talking about the virgins with the oil, be ready for the rapture. We have to be ready. We have to have that oil and, and, and the ignition of God's word. It produces a holy fire inside, like a lamp. To live for Jesus' return at any moment, to live by faith in him as Lord of your life. So you're looking at this is dark days that we're living in. We need a light inside. Amen? It says, don't hide your lamp under a basket. Yeah. It's kind of like one of those oxymoron things. If you were to put a light under a basket after a while, it would actually shine through the basket to some degree. So if there were, was any light to begin with, how could you hide it, right? And so they're truly more concerned, but the other side of things, they're truly more concerned about a party, more concerned than longing to see the bridegroom, the world around us. And so true believers will bring to them the fact that, you know, this kingdom that you're trusting in, it's coming to an end. But there is an eternal kingdom that is coming to replace it. Hence the image in the book of Daniel where the rock that comes hewn from the side of the mountain and hits the feet of the image and demolishes the kingdoms of this world. And the kingdoms of this world are no more. But the kingdom of our Lord is what lasts forever. In Hebrews 11, 7, it says, By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things, Amen. Jesus is warning us of things in Matthew 24. And they're warned of things in Noah's time, but they're not moved with a godly fear. We're studying about the fear, the awe of God on Tuesday nights. And, and so this man is preparing a boat. He's preparing for a time. And we're preparing for a time as well. We're preparing for the Lord's return. And Noah was preparing for the saving of his household. And men, we are instrumental in these last days for the saving of our households. And by this, the world around him, literally mocking him at the time, just like they're mocking the church right now. You notice they schedule every event on the news right on Sunday morning. Have you ever noticed that? It's very interesting. And so people choose to do other things rather than be in the Lord's presence, rather than be, being ignited by his word under the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what happened in Noah's day. And this is the warning that we are seeing as displayed in Hebrews eleven seven. So they thought, you know, 
He must have been the butt of all jokes. And maybe you feel like you're the butt of all jokes right now, being a Christian. Count it all joy. I know when you get persecuted, count it all joy. Another pastor shared with me when I came under attack recently, he said, it's great to be numbered among you. And you know, it's great to be numbered among God's people in this dark time. It's great to have the ignition of the power of God's word in our lives and the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit saying, come, Lord Jesus, I want you to come. Because the word of God tells us that we will live by faith. In Noah's day, the faith was rewarded that his whole household would be saved, but the world around him was condemned. But his life and his testimony was a testament to the fact that he was building on the kingdom of God. He was building, he believed God, and it was counted unto him righteousness. And he received it by faith in the Old Testament even. And Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, anyone, whosoever, Jew, Greek, Roman, Italian, you name it, African American, it's whosoever would believe. For it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. You got to ask myself, am I growing in the things of God? Am I building on the things of God in my life? Am I being ignited by the Word and the Spirit? Is God building something in my life? Is He building an ark of my life? Is He building an ark for my family? Is my fa I want my family to be saved, every single one of them. I'm so grateful as a father to see my son here and my granddaughter. We're believing for generations. I know Linda was mentioned that we want to see an end time revival. God is not slack in his promises. No, he's waiting. He wants people to be saved. He wants people to be saved and we are to proclaim the gospel. We're not to shy away from it. People who are rapture ready are bold in their faith. They call others to be ready for Jesus' return. He's coming back. You've got to get ready both in word and action. They're eager to build disciples for the kingdom of God. Rapture-ready people, they're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because there's a fire inside where they've got to say it. They're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. There is only one name under heaven. There's not many roads to heaven. There's not a separate stairway to heaven. It's you know, Led Zeppelin portrayed, no, the only stairway to heaven is through Christ. And we got to be bold enough to say it. And Acts 4, verse 11 and 12 says this, Jesus, this is the stone which was despised and rejected by you builders. And that's what you got to build your faith on. But the one who has become the chief cornerstone, there is salvation under no one else. Be not deceived, for there is no other name under heaven which has been given among people where we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. He sets the standard. What does this mean for us? In the generation of Noah, they were careless, they were cavalier, just like today. When Christ returns, people will continue living as they've always lived, in spite of cataclysmic warnings, earthquakes going on all around them, still living the same way that they lived. Inflation out of control. Long as I get my Starbucks, long as I get what I want, long as I can live for myself, and this is the way that the world lives. Warnings, predictions, they're all in Scripture. They focus on the present. That's what happened in Noah's day. 
They make plans for their future only to ensure their physical comfort. They will not give one thought to the possibility of what the prophets said were right. In short, they will not be looking or searching for a savior. They'll be lost. I would hate to be lost. I would hate to be just living for today. What is there to live for today that's more important than the kingdom of God? Nothing. So when Christ returns, people are going to live this way. They focus on the short term as if this life is the only thing to live for. So it's going to be an ordinary day, a day like any other day. It might be today. They'll miss the rapture because they live for the satisfaction of an earthly existence, the here and now. To be rapture ready, we've got to have the oil of the Holy Spirit, the ignition of the Word of God active in our lives. As if the virgins could give oil to the other ones that were not. The significance of that parable is there's going to be some people, even in the church, that have no oil they have no word of God active in their lives. And then all of a sudden, the church that's on fire is gone, and they realize, I'm in trouble. There is going to be a day coming that is going to be so hard to become a Christian after the fact that the church has left, because now, all of a sudden, everything that restrained evil is gone. Okay? And people will do more evil. It'll be like you've never seen before. You think we've got uh, gang murders and things going on right now? Wait till afterwards. But then, a false Christ will appear. An antichrist. One that will lead them astray and really give them some comfort to live for. He'll be a false shepherd. And he will lead them astray. And there will be such deception in the world that it will be so hard to become saved at that point. I shared in five points that, man, if you harden your heart today, you're in trouble. At least if I get a response out of you that I made you angry, at least I've got a response. At least there's something inside that's going on. I'd rather have you get angry at me when I'm preaching. Say, man, I hate that pastor. So what's <laughs> going on? Some conviction or something's happening. <laughs> but we can't care about what people think. Mm -hmm. Amen? We just got to present it. Mm -hmm. And so we present the Word of God with, with that oil, with that fire, with that desire. Boy, there was people walking to go to the parade. They were all around her huh, Nancy. And Nancy said, that was an on-fire message. That was a really good message about the Word of God, the power of the Word of God that I gave. And people would walk by and look at you. Go right about their own life. Go right about their own business. As far as they're concerned, they don't even know what Juneteenth was about. And I shared the fact that, you know, they received the word of freedom in Texas that day. They didn't know they were free. They didn't know yet that they were emancipated. They didn't know. But yet, the church knows that we're free, right? So they received a word of power and freedom that they didn't have before. And there's people walking around going to a parade. You know what? A half of them don't even know what it's about. It's just another day to maybe get drunk or high. Got no clue about the past, only living in the present. And the cost that was paid for freedom has always been immense. And for our freedom, it was huge because it cost the Son of God his life. And it is so incredible. 
And one day there is going to be an account for that price for everyone that has not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Such a glorious truth and yet to be passed by as I watched the other day. Do you believe that we're growing closer to the moment of a glorious return? Do you believe that today? We've got to live for Christ. We have to be people that are rapture ready, bold, living in faith, calling others to the fact that Jesus is returning, that he's coming soon, both in our word and our action, and we're eager to build disciples for the kingdom of God. Rapture ready people are not ashamed of the gospel. Look at Linda. She had a Bible study in her home the other day. So proud of you, Linda. That's incredible. Went out, reached out to her neighbors, and three of them came. The day is not lost. Remember that, that thing, what was it? In, uh, what was that um, movie where they pointed it? The people in the locker, they open a locker, and these little people are living in the locker. He's like, wait a minute. Somebody's got to tell them that there's something beyond the locker. And it's like, the guy sticks his finger in, and it's almost like, all is lost. All is lost. What is the name of that movie? Men in Black. Men in Black. Remember Men in Black? Yes. It's like, somebody's got to tell the people in the locker there's more to life than this. <laughs> and that was incredible. And they found out they were in kind of a sort of a locker themselves. Yeah. In the end. They took his watch. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, it's kind of like, a, it's, we're like almost living that in, in a way, in some ways. But, you know, the scripture tells us what it's all about. But let's pray together. Pray with me today. And say, Lord, oh, Lord. I do not know I when you're planning to come back. To come back. I, pray I pray I will be ready. I will be ready. Prepare my heart for the day of your choosing. Thank you for your promise of salvation. Ignite my life with the Holy Spirit. Set me ablaze with the word of faith to build your kingdom, Jesus. Please do this before the door closes on the, ark on the ark of your salvation, of your salvation. In, Jesus name. in Jesus name amen